Well, <clears throat> my wife's here. That changes the whole speech. That's going to happen. <laughs> I am whelmed. I'm not overwhelmed, but I am whelmed, I can tell you. You know, the, when we talked about the conference this week, and we've been talking about it for a year, we'll start talking about next year's conference next week, frankly. And uh, we kept thinking, you know, there's, a little, there's something missing. There's something that's just not here. And we talked about what we, the message we really wanted to deliver that you all can take home and have something to work on. When you get back home, you get back to your courthouse. And uh, we, we talked about a lot of different phrases and catchwords and sound bites, that sort of thing. And we came up with the uh, kind of subtopic of this year's conference, Restore What's Right. And as, as we printed all the material and we saw it kind of outlined with the little corners on it, everybody began to think, you know, what does that really mean? What does restore what's right mean? It sounds kind of simple. I'm going to tell you some stories this morning. But let me point out one thing. I'm not a professional writer and I'm not a professional speaker. And that is going to be abundantly clear to you later today. But I want to tell you some stories that I think illustrate what we mean when we say restore what's right. I grew up in the small East Texas town, Jefferson. It's the county seat of Marion County. Big Cypress Bio goes right through Jefferson, Texas, right behind the courthouse. Many years ago in the 1870s, uh, there was steamboat traffic. Stern wheelers came all the way from New Orleans up to Jefferson, picked up cotton, went back down the Big Cypress Bio to the Red River its confluence with the Mississippi and then into New Orleans. At about that same time, there were people in Washington who thought they knew how to restore what's right, so not much has changed in the last 130 years. The Army Corps of Engineers identified a log raft, a log jam up above Shreveport, Louisiana on the Red River. It was about 100 miles long. That log jam had been there for a long time. A hundred mile long log raft doesn't occur overnight. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers decided they were going to restore what's right. They were going to restore the Red River to what it was before the log jam appeared so that all those river boats could get all the way from New Orleans all the way up to Texarkana or into Lamar County and even into Fanning County. So in due form, they took all of their dynamite between Shreveport and Texarkana on the Red River, and they blew that log jam up. And I'm, when I say they blew it up, I mean they blew it up. Now, what you may not know is the Red River is the boundary between Caddo Parish and Bossier Parish in Louisiana. It separates the two cities of Shreveport and Bossier City. And before there were all those gambling casino boats on the Red River in Bossier City, there were tons of docks and warehouses and piers all sorts of mercantile activity going on on the Red River. And when the Army Corps of Engineers blew up that log jam, a 100-mile log jam rushed, and when I say rushed, I mean rushed, down the Red River between the cities of Shreveport and Bossier City, taking out everything, the docks, the warehouses, everything. It continued its trip down the Red River to the Mississippi and on into the estuary where it dumps into the Gulf of Mexico, where it stopped and blocked most of the traffic down there. There was another consequence of this activity, this restoration of what's right. All the water that had backed up into Big Cypress Bio and made Jefferson a viable river port rushed, and when I say rushed, I mean rushed, out of Big Cypress Bio down into the Red River. The river went down so fast that there was a stern wheeler called the Mitty Stevens that was loaded with cotton. They had just loaded in Jefferson and turned around and headed back to New Orleans. The water left the river so fast the Mitty Stevens was standed, stranded high and dry and remnants of it are still there. You can see them today. Now, the whole idea of this was to restore what's right, to restore the Red River to what it had been before. The only problem was nobody knew what it had been before. 
they actually accomplished their stated goal. They restored the Red River to what it had always been prior to the development of that log raft. And that is, if you go north of Paris, Texas into Oklahoma and you cross the Red River, you realize you can step over it there. They did restore it. No steamboat ever went up to Paris, Texas. They accomplished what they wanted to do by restoring that river to what it had previously been. The problem was they didn't know what it had been. So when we talk about restoring what's right, we need to know, first of all, what is right. What is right? You already know what right is because you have to do it every day. Jefferson at that time was a city of 35,000 people. It was second only to Galveston. After the log jam floated down the river and the riverboat traffic ceased, within a very short period of time, Jefferson became a little small sleepy town of 2,000 people. There's very little work, not much to do. When you go from 35,000 to 2,000 in, in about six months, it leaves a lot of things high and dry. One of the things that occurred was that all of these homes and buildings and warehouses, sal saloons, bars, restaurants, hotels, all that stuff that had been built to support this mercantile economy were empty, vacant. And because Jefferson did not have any sort of real si significant economic recovery, most of those buildings stayed that way for a long time. Our neighbor to the south, Marshall, Texas, which is Harrison County, prospered. The railroad stopped there through the latter part of the 19th century and into the 20th century. Marshall grew and prospered. Most of their old homes and old buildings were torn down to make way from, for new, more modern structures, but not in Jefferson. Then in the mid-1960s, when the idea of historic preservation became uh, a very important program for the state of Texas. Governor Alan Shivers had started the Historical Commission in the mid-1950s. Ten years later, it was active and engaged, and people from Houston and Dallas flocked to Jefferson for the weekend. They thought that Jefferson was a quaint little country village. At that time, I didn't know what the word quaint meant. I thought it meant you have to go to Marshall to buy a beer, but later on I found out that it actually meant something else, but those people began to buy up the old homes and old buildings and restore them, restore them. But unlike the Army Corps of Engineers, they had some idea of what those buildings had been. I actually lived in one of those houses for a while. My house was built in 1847. And thankfully, the restoration that occurred there included indoor plumbing. That was not there originally. So what the restoration projects became then, let's put it back the way it was so it'll look like it did in 1850, but we want it to be air conditioned and have electricity and indoor plumbing. So those restorations actually restored the old buildings and old homes to something that we would say today was really better than right. They were restored so that they could be usable now and in the future. There's a lot of things that are wrong right now, a lot of things wrong about our country. There are 9,000 channels on television, I think. I don't know, it seems like there are that many, but every time you stop on one, there are 16 people on the screen in these little boxes, and they're all talking at the same time very loudly. You can't tell what anybody's saying. You can't understand them, you can't hear them. They talk over each other, and they scream a lot. So we don't really know much about what truly is going on. We don't really know what is right. Even Mayor Rudy Giuliani said a couple of weeks ago, Sometimes the truth isn't really true. What? So I thought back about, you know, how did we get here? How, there, there are several reasons why restoration becomes necessary. But it boiled down, it becomes one thing, negligence. Something has been neglected necessitating 
a need for restoration. And, and neglect can come from two primary sources. One of them is just indifference. People become indifferent. They neglect things because they don't see that or feel the need to interfere and make any change. Neglect can also come from lack of resources. In Jefferson, nobody had the money to fix up those old houses. So they sat there just as they had been built. How did, how did we get as a country, as a nation, to where we are now so that we're even talking about restoring what's right? Many years ago, I remember watching television and, and for those of you, it, it was color television back then. I do remember black and white. President Nixon was in Houston for some purpose. I don't really remember why, but he was having a press conference after this meeting and present in the press room were reporters from the Houston area. There was a young television reporter from Houston. I don't remember which channel present in the room that day and his name was Dan Rather. The president had made some announcement and Mr. Rather stood up and asked a very lengthy, very pointed question. And President Nixon looked down at him and smiled and said, well, Mr. Rather, that's an interesting question. Are you running for something? Dan Rather was standing at his seat and he looked at the President of the United States and he said, no, Nixon, are you? There was an audible gasp in the room when he said that because it was the first time that a reporter had ever addressed the President of the United States without first saying Mr. President or President Nixon. It was the first time anybody could remember that a reporter had addressed the President of the United States simply by using his last name. That was a game changer. A game changer. A lot of people are saying, ooh, no respect for the office. Well, about three months later, the Watergate scandal broke. And it went downhill from there. You all know what happened there. For those of you, uh, Lisa, you need to ask your mother about it. But um, after Watergate, the world changed. Washington changed. We all changed. It was a, 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 a shift in American culture. Let me fast forward a little bit. Clearly, that was an indication of something that was wrong, was it not? Clearly, something wrong was going on in our country. I was appointed county judge in 1995, and because of I was appointed, I had to run in the next general election. And so in 1996, um, I signed up to run, and I had an opponent. I had never run for office before, had no interest in politics particularly. And the young lady who was running against me had served four years as county judge in Marion County, two terms before. She knew a lot more about the job than I did. She was eminently more qualified at the time than I was. And one of the things I learned was that if you're a candidate for any gov uh, county office in a small county, you go to all those forums. I don't care where they are, and most of them are hosted by a volunteer fire department. So I go to the first forum, and we draw straws, and I get the short straw, which means I go first. I learned a valuable lesson that night. You always want to go second. So I get up and I say whatever it is I had planned to say, and frankly now, I don't remember what I said and I don't even remember whether it was true or not, but I did get up and manage to get through about five minutes. And this young lady stands up and she says, I'll tell you what, if you elect me county judge, we're gonna have commissioner's court meetings all over the county. We're gonna come out here to Smithland, we're going to the north side of Lake of the Pines, we're going to the west end of the county, and we're gonna meet at night so you can come. That fellow over there likes to have his commissioner's court meetings at nine o'clock in the morning down in Jefferson because he knows you have a job and you can't be there because he's hiding stuff from you. 
He's hiding things from you. So a after the forum was over and I felt a little bit uh, used, to say the least, we're, I left and we're walking across the parking lot and she's right ahead of me and I said, Lola, hold up a minute. Wait just a second. And she stopped and smiled and we shook hands and I said, Lola, what are you doing? What are you, why are you telling those people that? You know better than that. You have to set your term of court the first meeting of the year and you have to meet in the county seat and you have to meet in the designated place. You, you can't have those meetings all over the county like that. And she looked at me and said, yeah, I know that, but they don't. I know that, but they don't. What's wrong with that? When did it become okay for politicians to feel like they can say anything they want to to any audience they address just to play and pander to that audience so they can be supported and get votes? When, it, when did it become okay to say, yeah, I know that, but they don't? When did that get to be all right? We need to fix that. That's something that needs to be restored restoration demanded by years and years of neglect. Now look, I don't mean, I'm not gonna pick on anybody, but I wanna tell you, I've been on a school board and I've been on a city council and I've been on a commissioner's court and as my lovely wife is fond of pointing out, I'm not very smart. I'm a slow learner. It took me a while to figure that out. But I'm gonna tell you something that I've observed over the last 24 years of working with you folks. You're the best people in the world. It's odd that 24 years is exactly one third of my life and I've spent the last one third of my life with you. And I am very, very grateful for having had that privilege. You're the finest group of people I've ever been associated with. And I want you to know that I said this one time at a, giving a speech and somebody came up later and uh, didn't like what I said, but so I thought, well, I think I'll say that again, which as Pat knows, is something I typically do. But what I said was this, you all are part of the only constitutionally created full-time paid professional government in the state of Texas. Everybody else is an amateur. Everybody else is part-time. You're, on, you're the only constitute, constitutionally created full-time paid professional government in the state of Texas. You don't just hold an office. You have a job to do. Your office carries with it specific daily responsibilities that you must perform. Failure to perform those responsibilities it could subject you to a suit for removal from office. So you don't just hold an office. I'm going to tell you, during that 1996 campaign, I learned a lot of lessons, as I'm sure all of you do. And don't you just love campaigning? It was my favorite thing to do. I campaigned three times, and I hit a deer all three years coming back from one of those four. There's a message there, folks. We're just not paying. Y'all need to pay attention. Well, I'm, I'm campaigning one day in the 96 election, and I go out to the Lake of the Pines, and I'm driving up and down in, in the residential subdivisions, and those houses are not very close together, so when you park your truck, you can only call on about five houses before you have to walk back to your truck and move it. You know what I'm talking about. So I get to the end of a street and I see, I walk up into the yard and I see my, my opponent's signs, there are like six of them in the yard facing every direction. And I thought, well, you know, because I'm not really smart, so I walk up and knock on the door. The door opens and I take a card out and I start to say, good morning, I'm J And about the time she says, I know who you are and I wouldn't vote for you if you paid me. Thank you, ma'am, I appreciate it. And then she said, are you stupid? Can you not read? Don't you see those signs out there? I said, yes, ma'am, and I'm very sorry. I didn't mean to disturb you. I, I won't bother you anymore. And she said, well, I hope not. Get out of my yard. Yes, ma'am, I'm gone. So I left. 
fast forward a few months and my secretary, Mary Jane, sticks her head in the door. It's February or March the following year. Oh, and by the way, the lady lost. Um, Mary Jane sticks her head in the door and she says, hey, there's somebody here to see you. And I said, good, great, show them in. And she looks at me and she says, uh, it's Nadine Day. And I said, so? She said, duh, the lady that slammed the door in your face? I said, how'd you know about that? She says, it's a small county. I said, well, show her in. This can't get much worse. I think I've, I've pretty much done all, I, all the damage I can do. So Mrs. Day came in and sat down and she said to me, I bet you I'm the last person you ever expected to see in your office. I said, well, no, ma'am, I'm glad to see you. What can I do for you? And uh, she proceeded to tell me that her husband was having a hard time getting in the VA hospital over in Shreveport. So I called the veteran service officer he came right down, talked with her, made a couple of calls from my office, uh, arranged an appointment, uh, all went well. Uh, she called me back a few weeks later saying he had been admitted to the hospital and treatment had been provided and he was doing so much better. And she thanked me for, my, for the help. 1998, because I don't think anybody in Marion County really thought I did a very good job at anything, and 1998 rolls around and I got to run again, right? And I've got another opponent, which I typically did. <clears throat> so in January of that year, I just filed a, to run, and Mary Jane sticks her head in the door and says, Nadine Day's back. I said, send her in. <clears throat> she came to the door and stood there and she said, how many yard signs do you have? I said, well, I've got, I think there's about a hundred of them in the bed of my truck. And she said, I want every one of them. And I said, okay, well, I'll bring them to you. She said, no, I want them now. So we go out and I take the signs out of my truck, put them in hers. And she said, these signs will be up by the weekend. So that weekend I ride out to Lake of the Pines and my, I've got a yard sign in every yard that I go by. This lady has been working, and it's cold and wet and damp and miserable outside. If you haven't been to Marion County in January, you need to go. As I rode around, I thought, wow, that's really something. So I went around and came back to her house and my signs were in the yard, so I had a little bit better sense of my, how my reception might go that time. So I walk up, knock on the door, and Miss Day, bless her heart, comes to the door, opens the door and says, oh gosh, I'm so glad to see you, come on in. So I walk in, she pours me a cup of coffee, and we're sitting there having coffee, and I, I said, boy, I really appreciate all the help with the yard signs. She said, oh, I'm just tickled to death to do it. And I said, well, you know, if, if, if you don't mind my asking, what happened? What changed your mind? I mean, I was here two years ago and you slammed the door in my face and she laughed and I didn't. And she, <laughs> she, said, she said, oh, honey, oh, honey, you help people who don't vote for you. You help people who don't vote for you. That's it. That's it. That's the holy grail. That's the password. You help people who don't vote for you. And you do. Every single one of you do that every single day, don't you? And you know what? That's what makes you who you are. That's what makes you the only constitutionally organized, full-time, paid professional government in Texas. That's what, means, that's what it means to be a servant. And that's what you do every day. I think it's time that we start talking about a movement that at my age, movement can mean a lot of things, folks. I don't want to get personal here, but... Uh, <clears throat> 
what, what I would say is this, I think there's, there's something that we can do. I think there's something that we need to do because when I say full-time paid professional government, I mean it because the, the government, and is, is there anybody here in the audience who's, who's with the state legislature? Any members, staffers, anybody like that? Would you please identify yourselves because I'm gonna ask you to leave the room. I'm about to talk about you. Let me ask you this, when I, when I was elected county judge, there were 3,500 votes cast in Marion County. I'll bet you, I didn't, do, I didn't do the math, I didn't count, but I'll bet you I knew 500 of those people by their first name. Wonder what that ratio is, I don't do math, I'm, just, I'm not supposed to, I've been told not to do that. But, I knew 500 of those 3,500 people by their first name. They were people I could call on the phone and say, hey, Freddie, how are you? Every United States congressman represents about 800,000 people. How many of those people do you believe he or she knows by their first name? And what is the percentage of voters who elect them that they could call by their first name? How many of those congressmen do you suppose have had some little old lady about this tall and mad as a hornet push their grocery cart in front of you, right in front of the Fruit Loops, and start shaking their finger in your face and asking you if you had any idea how high her taxes were? There is an intimacy about county government that is not shared as you go up the food chain. And I'm not sure you're even going up the food chain. I'm not sure you're not going down the food chain because the higher up we go, the further away we get. You have the most intimate relationship with your constituency than anybody else in government. Certainly more than members of the state legislature, certainly more than members of the United States Congress. And I would suggest to you that that relationship that you have with your constituents is something that they miss, something that they would like to have but never will. I was stunned the first time I ran for office because I got elected. I had no idea that would happen because, you see, I grew up in Jefferson, Texas. I was there as a small kid. I played Little League Baseball there. I drove my car too fast past the Dairy Queen every Saturday night. People knew me. They knew who I was. They knew my parents. They knew my grandparents. And those people voted for me anyway. It is... It is stunning the sense of responsibility that you feel when your friends and your neighbors, my mother-in-law voted for me. And she knew me as well as almost anybody. But the sense of responsibility you feel when that occurs is derived from what they say to you. They trust you. They know everything there is to know about you and they still trust you. They elect you and send you to that courthouse to act like an adult, get along with everybody else in the courthouse, shut your mouth, do your job, and don't spend any more money than you absolutely have to. They trust you to do that on their behalf. How many of you know your your congressman as well as you know your county judge or your treasurer or your commissioner or your tax collector. There's an intimacy about, about county government that isn't shared by any other level of government and I can, I can tell you something that I bet you've observed too that was one of the first things I noticed about being around county people and that is when you talk about someone else in your courthouse, Kim Hoffman, you say, it's my treasurer, that's my sheriff, that's my commissioner. You use a possessive pronoun to talk about your colleagues. Now you may scream at them at some point in time in public or in private, 
And somebody else may talk badly about your commissioner, but you don't and you won't let them. We refer to each other by using possessive pronouns. This is Austin, Texas, and you heard me say the other day, Austin, welcome, 50 square miles surrounded by reality. I have to change that. It's now about 75 square miles surrounded by reality, but we learned a long time ago that in serving you, those of us who work at the Texas Association of Counties, in serving you, we can't sit in Austin, Texas, stare out the window and decide what you need. We need you to tell us, and there are four questions. And this is how we do our part, our part of restoring what is right. This is how we respond to you. This is how we do what we're supposed to do. This is how we do the right thing. This is how we serve you. And we go out and we ask four questions. What are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? What do we need to start doing? And what do we need to stop doing? If you'll get the answer to those four questions, you'll be able to provide county folks with everything they need. We work hard at TAC to serve you and to do what you need us to do and to do the right thing. I would suggest to you that when we talk about restoring what's right, and I'm pointing to this because they, they have this little thing down here that's to remind me of what I'm supposed to say next. It hasn't changed since I started talking, so I don't know what it's, I'm supposed to do with it. But it's really cool. I think when we talk about restoring what's right, I think when we're talking this morning about restoration at our level, I think we're not talking about looking into the past. I think we're talking about looking into the future. I think what we're talking about is taking something that has been neglected and needs some attention and redoing it so that it will work for years going forward. We don't want to go back to 1950. Most of you can't go back to 1950 because you weren't here. So we'll, let's say we don't want to go back to 1970. How's that? That's better. So what I think we're talking about when we say we need to restore what's right, we're talking about taking those institutions that we hold near and dear the institutions of government, of the people, by the people, for the people, what happened to that? Of a government that actually feels a sense of obligation because they know the people who voted for you, you know the people who voted for you, actually trust you to go to work every day and do what you're supposed to do. It's a restoration of a, of a, a culture. It's a restoration of a culture, and that culture has to has to be based upon kindness, integrity, courtesy. All the things that you do every day naturally, you don't have to think about it. But there are some people upstream who need to hear from you, and I'm, I'm, I call this the trickle up theory. And here's what I would ask you to do, because I think you can begin the restoration project right now. And I'll tell you what I would like for you to do and think about as you, as you set about trying to do this. You need, several years ago, I was driving back from West Texas and I had this epiphany of an idea. And the reason I remember it is because that doesn't happen very often and every one of them stick in my mind. And I got home and I called Haley Click and I said, Haley, I got this great idea. I want to I want to make a bumper sticker. And she said, as she usually does when I have an idea, uh-oh. I said, I want a bumper sticker, and I want that bumper sticker to say, it's a shame that everybody that knows how to run this country is busy at the courthouse. And that afternoon I had a thousand of those bumper stickers, and I've handed them out ever since. 
I meant it then, I mean it now. It's a shame that everybody that knows how to run this country is busy at the courthouse. So here's what my trickle up theory is all about. I think that what you all need to do is assume the responsibility of teaching all of those other part-time amateurs how you govern. Because you really know how to do it and I don't think they do. And those of you who are here from those other institutions, I warned you. It's a trickle up theory. You need to contact the members of your state and your federal delegation from your area and you need to tell them how you do it because they don't know. And I submit to you, if they did know, that's what they'd be doing, isn't it? Because you are the people who are getting it right. You know what right is. The only way you can restore what you know is right is by teaching others how to do it the way you do. Because folks, nobody does it better than you do. Nobody. I didn't expect Pat to show up today, so the last four pages of this speech had just become absolutely worthless. There are things in there she just won't let me say, so let's just agree that, that I just won't read that, okay? But I will take a point of personal privilege and say a couple of things that, that I really do mean. This comes, this isn't written down anywhere. This is all extemporaneous. I actually didn't say anything I had written down. I didn't, I, I forgot where I put it. This is somebody else's notebook. I don't know where, where it came from. <clears throat> I want to thank you, each and every one of you, all of you elected officials, all the folks from TAC who are here for giving me the opportunity to be a part of this group for the last 24 years. We've all been members of various affinity groups through the years, whether it's a local Rotary Club or your church, or in my case, you know, it's a member of the Bar Association, so when I talk about affinity groups, I'm not talking about a very high bar here, okay? But I have never been in my life associated with people who had the sense of obligation and dedication that you all do. And it has been a, a great privilege for me to have been allowed to participate in some small way with you over the last quarter of a century. It is a great club to be a member of. And I commend each and every one of you for the work that you do in your community I know most of you ran for the job because of the money. I did, I mean. No one ever really stops to say thank you. But from the bottom of my heart today, I thank each and every one of you for the service you provide, the unselfish way in which you provide it, and the fact that none of you are smart enough to quit. You just keep going back. That is commendable. You're not what's wrong with this country. You are what's right. And it's time for you to tell everybody else how you do it and tell them that's how you expect it to be done. Thank you very much for, for being here and supporting us, supporting TAC, supporting our conference for supporting all the programs we do all over the state. It's the reason we do it. And with that, I'd like to say my final adios.